and uh, but we're thankful for what the Lord's doing. Brother Carr, we're glad that you're here tonight, and uh, y'all sing a few for us. While walking down memory lane Not so long ago Satan came by my way Making me feel so low He brought up thoughts of hurt and pain When I had gone astray He wanted to discourage me As I walked along my way He said, you're undeserving Cause I know where you've been And I have a record of your life When you were bound by sin I know the darkest secrets That you would never tell What makes you think you don't deserve A place with me in hell I heard the old accuser And this was my reply Well, you're right for all the things I've done I sure deserve to die My righteousness is filthy rags My goodness is unclean There's only one thing I can say To what you've said to me It's under the blood Oh, praise His dear name I'm not what I used to be My life has been changed Not shackled by sin and shame It's already gone I'm happy reminding Him It's under the blood Many times I've stumbled along this earthly way And i failed a thousand times before For that I am ashamed I'm sorry for the things I've done But the Lord could hear my cry And I rejoice when I heard His voice This was his reply Victory was given When you were born again I washed that stained and sinful past And put new life within No longer do you bear the mark That sin had brought your way With happiness and peace with God You now can say it's under the blood oh praise his dear name I'm not what I used to be my life has been changed not shackled by sin and shame it's already gone I'm happy reminding him it's under the blood oh, what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus oh, what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus, it's under the blood, oh praise his dear name, oh 
I'm not what I used to be My life has been changed Not shackled by sin and shame It's already gone I'm happy reminding Him it's under the blood I'm happy reminding You it's under the blood you're happy your sins are washed away tonight, holler at me, amen. amen. What a God we serve that can take a black heart, wash it in red blood, make it white as snow. <laughs> there ain't nobody like Jesus Christ. I still have not gotten under, getting over, getting under the blood of Jesus. I sure am thankful for who He is tonight. I'm thankful that when He sought me, he caught me, He bought me, and He's taught me what it means to be a Christian. And I sure do love Him tonight. I love that song. I like your piano player too. He's pretty good. I listened to him play this morning, and I sat back there and I thought, you know what? He's a whole lot better than that contraption I got up here. And so we put this together. We've never sang with him before, and he's done a great job. And I want you to listen to this song, probably one of my favorite songs is a woman by the name of Kyla Rowland wrote this song. I like them songs that really reach you where you're living. Yeah. And this song just simply says, Did I mention that I love him? I don't know why you came to church tonight, but before you leave, you ought to tell him how much he means to you. I'll tell you something, if it wasn't for the love of Jesus Christ, I wouldn't be in church tonight. Yeah. I wouldn't be married tonight. I know me. I know how crazy I could be. My two little girls wouldn't have a preaching daddy. They'd have a drunk. The only reason I'm here tonight, there's no good in me. I can't brag on who I am. But I can point you to one who's better than anybody else, and his name's Jesus. Listen to this song as Katie sings it. Did I mention that I love him? Feel free to worship tonight. That's how we like going to church. Amen? Listen. David sang the praises of the glory of Jehovah. Paul preached that all is lost, save knowing Christ. John said he is precious. By leaning on his bosom So for a moment May I humbly testify Did I mention that I love him How I worship and adore him when I can see no way, He makes a way. Did I mention He's been faithful to every promise He's ever made me? I love Him. That's all I want to say And how many sermons Can be preached about my Jesus How many songs can be sung About God's Son Oh, there are not enough words, enough notes in the music to tell the story of all my Savior has done. Did I mention that I love Him? How I worship and adore Him When I can sing no 
way. You ever been there before? He makes a way. He makes a way. Did I mention he's been faithful to every promise he's ever made me? I love him. That's all I want to say. Did I mention that I love him? How I worship and adore him when I can sing away. He makes a way. He makes a way. Did I mention he's been faithful to every promise he's ever made me? I love him. That's all I want to say. Did I mention he's been faithful to every promise he's ever made me? I love him. That's all I want to say. I love him. That's all I want to say. Blessing. Amen. Boy, I tell you what, that ought to stir your heart tonight. And uh, good to have the Carr family with us. I preached him to death this morning. And uh, but I, we, of course, we, we love good singing around here, but we love preaching even more than singing. Amen. I do. I, I always love good gospel singing. I love it. Uh, I used to follow it a lot more than I, I do today, obviously. When I was a young man, I used to go chase him uh, quartets sometimes around town and around just be. But, I, you know, I'll be honest, a lot of that stuff is nothing but promotion and show, and you get around a little bit. And I like the songs. But I tell you what, there's nothing that's ever came above preaching. And I, I want this ministry built on the preached Word of God. And there's a lot of churches that put a lot of emphasis on singing. And I love good singing. I do. I love good choirs. We're trying to get that uh, going, to, well, kicking it off again uh, Saturday or uh, Sunday night. And I uh, love good choir music and love good specials. And we ought to put the best we possibly can into it. But when you open up the Word of God, and man, I tell you, that changes everything. And so let's set up tonight, and I appreciate them coming to sing, but Brother Brent's going to come and preach one more time to us tonight. Let's give him a hand as he comes. Brother Brent, you come and let's preach. Amen. Stand all over the house. Stand to your feet and stretch your legs out a little bit. And I want you to go in your Bibles to John chapter number 12. John chapter number 12, and we're going to take a text out of this scripture. And uh, I believe this is the inerrant Word of God. Amen. It means it has no error in it. Somebody say amen right there. I believe it's the infallible Word of God. There won't be no fallacy to it. Uh, you can put it to the test and it won't ever fail you. And uh, I believe this is the absolute Word of God. I put my faith in it, put my family in it, and uh, I've, I put some fun into it too. Amen. I like it. And uh, I'm one of those who like, this is the third round that we've been in today in church. I'm one of those who like to go from sun up to sun down, amen? Uh, I put it this way, when I go to a buffet, you ain't going to see me just take one trip to the buffet bar and just call it quits. I ate with your preacher today, he ain't one of those that will do that either. Uh, I mean, I looked over there and he was going to town on uh, sweet potato and shrimp and everything else you could fry. Uh, chicken, all that stuff, and uh, and I can tell you put it down, amen. But that's how I like going to church too. I, I like I like going back two or three times because I know that if it was good that first time, there's something else I didn't get. I want to get back to get it, amen. amen. Uh, like that banana pudding at, at Christmas time and uh, on homecoming days. Uh, don't give me just one little bitty bowl of it. I want a whole vat of it that I can swim in, amen. 
<clears throat> some of you looking at me like I'm crazy. Y'all know we're supposed to be fat in Jesus' name, right? Hey, man, all these people trying to lose weight and get thin and all that kind of stuff, I think that's of, of the devil. That's worldly. And I can prove it. The Bible says when people are thin and lean in Scripture, it's a prophecy that they are sick and sinful. But the Bible's can I get an amen? The Bible says that God's people will be fat and flourishing. Is that in the Bible? That's in your King James Bible. Fat and flourishing. I'm working on my salvation, hallelujah, and loving every... Can all the fat people say amen? Y'all smile at me, please. Am I on? I don't even know if I'm on. I'm on. I'm on. Good. Uh, keep me cranked up, brother. I, I don't have much of a voice. Uh, and in fact, if you'll keep this on right here, I'll just preach right into this one. I like the sound of that. And uh, I'm going to be reading out of John chapter number 12. Thank you. Yeah, give me just a little bit more. John chapter number 12 in your Bibles. Are you there? Say amen. amen. The Bible says, Then Jesus six days before the Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead. That order excites you. Lazarus was there which had been dead, whom he, being Jesus, raised from the dead. Now, I'm of the persuasion that if Jesus has enough power to call you out of your grave, you ought to hang out with him for a little while. Amen. Amen. The Bible says there they made him a supper and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. If Jesus is sitting at the table, I want to be sitting at the table. I'm not sure. I've seen them do it before, but there's some people that say they get saved, but they don't ever leave the cemetery. They say they get called out of their death and trespasses of sins, but they don't ever leave where God saved them from. I reckon the best thing to do is if Jesus is sitting at the table, come and dine with Him, sit down with Him. That's what old Lazarus did. I like Lazarus. And the Bible said, Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped His feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Y'all say that with me, those three words. Let her alone. Jesus said, Let her alone against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. You can have a seat. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Tonight, I ask that you would help us, Lord. We, we, we've kidded about it, we've joked about it, we've laughed about it, but Lord, the truth of the matter is, is we do need another dose tonight. I need you. God, there's a lot of folk in here that the devil knows their address. He knows where they live. Lord, you told us that we should come to this place so that we could equip ourselves for those places where the devil has a territory and rules and reigns. God, I ask that you would equip your people tonight and encourage them, encourage their hearts, engage their mind, but Lord, enable them for service tonight. I ask these things in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus Christ, the name that's so powerful, the name that's so high, that every knee one day will bow and every tongue will confess that you, Jesus Christ, is the Son of God. I ask you tonight that you'd help me preach. Lord, don't let me be a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal to these people. God, I don't want to be somebody that just makes a lot of noise. But Lord, I ask that your word would make a lot of difference in their lives tonight. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, I humbly pray, amen and amen. 
the last time that we saw this cast of characters get together that we find in John chapter number 12, it's a different scene. In fact, you don't have to go too far to see that the same group of people that's gathered in John 12 that I read to you about is gathered together in John chapter number 11, just one chapter over. But the subject and the scene is very different in context. Here they're gathered around this table and there's worship and there's adoration and there's glorification and there's God Himself sitting at the table. And everybody's loving on Jesus. And I like coming to the table and loving on the Lord, don't you? But in John 11, the scene is different. They're not gathered around the table. They're gathered around a tomb. And there they are and they're not praising Jesus but they're asking questions about where he is Jesus. They're not giving praise and loving on the Lord, but there's a lot of doubt about what the Lord is doing. Can I tell you something? There's some people in here tonight, you've had to go through some graveyard experiences. We were sitting at the table today and heard the story about how your pastor's wife lost her mother just two years ago, I believe, to cancer. My wife lost her mother 10 years ago this year to cancer. And there's many times that you have to go physically through a cemetery. And there may be a lot of questions. There may be somebody in here tonight and you've got cancer in your body or you've had to sit beside a loved one who's had cancer and maybe you've had to go through those trials and those tests and there's been a lot of questions in there in your life about why God would allow you to go through that when a drunk man on the street can live however he wants to and as far as the world's concerned, perfectly healthy, just killing himself every day with a bottle to his lips and you wonder how in the world is it that they get along cancer free and then a good saint of God has to go through that trouble and trial maybe you've never been through that experience it's a trouble in time but there's some people in here tonight though physically you may have not had to bury a loved one or you've not had to go through that deep dark valley and those questions of asking why but you've had to spiritually go through a cemetery and had to bury some dreams in your life. Maybe you've had to go through some circumstances just like Mary and Martha did where they didn't understand why God was doing what He was doing. Maybe you've come to a place in your life where you've stopped and the God put on the brakes and life just stopped for a minute. Maybe you went through a depression or maybe you went through a debt you couldn't pay. Maybe you've even been through a divorce and you've been through a dark place where you just looked around and you couldn't couldn't find God anywhere in the middle of it. And there you sat and here you are trying to experience Christmas but you just don't feel like rejoicing. You just don't feel like going through the happy times because 2017 will only remind you about how bad life can really get to and how you can hit rock bottom. But I want to tell you something just like God didn't leave Mary and Martha in that tomb and in that cemetery God's not going to leave you where you are tonight. He's not going to leave you in death. He's not going to leave you in depression. He's not going to leave you where you are. But God is the author and the finisher of our faith. That means what God started in me, God's going to finish it in me. And God is writing the book of my life. Cancer may have a chapter in your life. Depression may have a chapter in your life. Doubt may have a, a chapter in your life. But God is the author and the finisher. You ask old Job if he didn't have to go through some trouble in life and it seemed like the devil was writing every one of those chapters of ashes and burying children and having balls covered on your body and losing everything in two minutes and 15 seconds of all that you would work your whole life for. Ask Him if life don't get bad. But I want to tell you something. Just like God didn't leave him in the ashes in Job 42, the Bible said that God gave back to him a double portion. I want to tell you something. God will finish the chapter of your life if you're faithful to Him like God wants to. And though the devil gets the pen and he writes bad in your life, 
life and he writes hell in your life, God gets the pen back and says, now watch me write this for his good and my glory. I feel like preaching tonight. I hope you feel like listening. Oh, I'm glad he doesn't leave us at the tomb. Tonight, I want to preach real shortly on this subject. When God brings you from the tomb and sets you at the table. I'm glad He is a God that is not finished with your life yet. Don't give up on Him, honey. He ain't giving up on you. When God brings you from the tomb to set you at the table. Now there's a lot of responses that takes place. There's a lot of people, a lot of characters that's gathered around this table that I could go to each and every one of those people that's gathered at that table tonight. I could tell you about how I'm like Lazarus. I remember the day that Jesus called me out of my death and out of my sins and called me out of death door and gave me eternal life and my life changed from that moment forward. I could talk about how Martha was in there cooking hamburgers and french fries and she's serving and she's being faithful and I'm thankful for all the servants of God that's in the house that's serving God and being faithful and ain't just sitting on a pew somewhere occupying a space but ain't investing in the ministry but tonight I want to take and I want to look at the life of Mary and how Mary responded to what God did when God brought them from the tomb and sat them at the table can I give them to you real quick? And then we'll go eat some ice cream somewhere. Amen. The first response that I see Mary have is she released the content on the Lord. She released the content of everything she had on the Lord. The Bible said that Mary then took a pound of ointment very costly. See, if you're going to give anything to God, if you're going to give God anything out of your life, it's going to come with a price. It's going to have to... Listen, you can't just give God what everybody else has given God. You can't just give God what you see somebody else give God. This was a very personal matter that Mary had with Jesus. Now what she did was she made a decision in her heart that I've got to give him something because he's given so much to me. Do you have that in your spirit? Do you have that in your heart that you want to give back to God all of you because he gave all of him to you? When you've got a God who can raise dead things in your life, when you've got a God that can fill your table full of blessings, when you've got a God that's his good as Jesus is. I wish you'd help me preach tonight. When you've got a God that's as good as Him, it ought to make you want to give something back to Him. And you know what Mary did? Mary decided. She said, I'm going to go back in my room, in my life, and I'm going to give Him something because He's given so much to me. And it was a response that she had to release her gift to the Lord. Your life is the same way. You cannot just give God what... Listen, if you shout when everybody else is shouting, your shouting is cheap. If you sing songs just like everybody else is singing songs, your songs are cheap. But it's in those hard times when you don't feel like singing, you don't feel like shouting, you don't feel like worshiping, you don't feel... Listen, when everybody else is living right, it's easy for you to live right. But what if everybody else decided to get out of this thing? Is that going to mean you're going to get out of this thing? The thing I love about Mary is nobody prompted her, nobody petitioned her, nobody told her what to do. She made up her own mind, she made up her own heart that I'm going to go give God what... No Nobody else at this table is given to God. God don't want you to give what somebody else has got. God wants you to go in the recesses of your heart and give Him what nobody else can give Him. And that's all of you. She released it all on the Lord. She went back. Listen, those decisions will be pricely. They will come with a cost. It's going to cost you something to live right for God in this day and age. You're seeing that today. But here she goes and she takes something that is of great worth. And it was a very private thing she decided to do. Nobody told Mary. The preacher didn't stand up and say, Mary, I think you ought to give so and so. 
she made up her own mind, Brother Jesse. She decided, I'm going to give him something whether or not anybody else at this table wants to. And she gave it to him because it's personal. But I want you to see this. She made her decision in private, personal. But she made the display very public. Other people saw what Mary did. And there's some people that need to see what you're doing for the Lord too. There's some people that you work with, they need to know how much you love Jesus. They need to see, they don't need to just hear how much you love Jesus. They need to see you love Jesus. I sit in church often. We're in church and I see people saying, Oh, how I love Jesus. And there they say, Oh, how I love Jesus. As long as everything's on time. Oh, how I love Jesus. Man, they don't look like they love Jesus at all. But you know what I love to see? I love to look around and check people out. And I love to see those old saints of God that it don't matter if anybody else around them shouting. They got their hand up. They got tears coming out of their eyes. And God is doing something on the inside of their hearts so much that everybody else can see it. When she poured this onto the Lord, the Bible says that it filled the house where they were sitting. And honey, if that was so powerful and potent enough of an anointing that it filled the house, what do you think it did to the one she poured it on? Everywhere Jesus went, everybody could smell on Jesus what Mary had given him. And listen, I want to tell you something. You ought to give everything you've got to God and watch what He can do and see how far He can carry it. Somebody said one time that that this the commentator was talking about this bottle that she broke open and poured it on the Lord and said that those those bottles they had a purpose. Does anybody remember what the purpose of the spikenard was? It was to anoint what? Dead bodies. They're dead loved ones. That's why they had this stuff. Seems like Mary had someone die in her family recently. But he didn't get it. <laughs> and then one commentator said this, said, well, Mary was probably... Y'all, do you ever argue with commentators? I do all the time. I'll preach to them. They're dead and in the ground. They can't even hear me. I'll preach to them. He said, well, Mary did not give it to Lazarus because Mary was reserving it for herself. <laughs> not after this day. It didn't say that Mary poured a drop. It did not say that Mary poured just a little ounce. But it said that Mary broke open the box and gave it all to Him. I want to tell you something. What you need to do with your life, the Bible tells us that God never blessed anything until He broke it first. You ought to be willing for God to break you open and to pour out of the contents of your life so that other people out there can know how good your God is. How many of y'all like cereal? Y'all like cereal? I love cereal. I love it. I love it. I, I, I'll go to hotel rooms and in the middle of the night, I'll be sitting over in the corner and everybody's asleep and I'm over there chewing my cereal in my little bowl. I love cereal. My mom and daddy wouldn't let me get the, the Fruit Loops back then. They're not here tonight, so I can talk about them. But my parents, they would not give us those, those, I'm talking about, you remember those boxes? They used to have the prizes in them. We never got those. We didn't get the fruity stuff. We had to eat that dried up cracker juice kind of stuff that didn't have no taste to it at all because mom and daddy was worried about it rotting out our teeth. Well, you know what I did when I got old enough to buy my own box of cereal? I went and got the most sugary box of cereal I could find every now and then I'll call my I'm bitter about it you can see it I'm bitter that they didn't let me enjoy my childhood and eat some good cereal and them fruit loops and all that kind of stuff that's bad enough to kill you they wouldn't let me get all that stuff so in the middle of the night I'll call them up and I'll just sit I won't say a word I'll just sit there and eat my cereal on the phone we went to a place and they didn't have none of that fruit stuff and I had to get this box of cereal called Life. You go to your grocery store and it's sitting there. On the shelf, a box of Life cereal. I went and got that and then I got a whole pound of sugar and poured it on that cereal. And it was some of the best stuff in the world. At midnight, I'm just sitting there eating Life and loving it. You know what? Your life is just like that box of cereal. 
That box of cereal, the intention of that cereal was not to just sit on the shelf so people could walk by and stare at it. Your life's just like that. Your life is not intended for people just to look at you and see you that you have life. But the purpose of that box of cereal, if that box of cereal stays on that shelf and nobody ever opens it, you know what happens? It stales. It dries up and it molds. And it's of no good. And your life's the same way. If you reserve your life for you and it's all about you and it's not about anybody else and it ain't about helping your brother, it ain't about helping people in the church and it's not about helping your pastor and it's not about reaching out to help the community and there's nothing in your life that is outward but it's all inward, your life will dry up and die. That box of cereal was meant to be opened up and you know what else? It was meant to be poured out. And you know what you know what you do to a box of cereal after you pour it out you pour a little milk on it. The Bible tells us that this is the milk of the word of God. And you know what I do every now and then when I, I just get by myself and I pour out my life on the Lord and then I'll take the Word of God and just pour the Word of God into my life. Every day I wake up, I try to read the Bible and I get that milk in me because when I'm dry and I can't find anything worth living for, I'll get in that Bible and let it flow over me. And it, I'm talking about it gets me real sopping wet with the Holy Ghost of God sitting in the middle of that and I'll let it saturate my life so it ain't dry anymore then you know what I do I take a pound of sugar pour it in oh taste and see that the Lord is good he's sweeter than honey in the honeycomb and that's what Jesus can do with your life but you must release it to him first not only did she release the contents on the Lord, but watch this. She resisted. This, this is the reaction that Mary had. She released the content, but she resisted the critic. She resisted the critic. What do you mean, preacher? The Bible says that as Mary is pouring this, and she's worshiping the Lord, and she's praising the Lord, and she's pouring from head all the way down to his feet. She begins to wipe his feet with her hair. She begins to weep and cry over. Listen, if God brings you from where God brought Mary, you'd be crying too. You'd be worshiping a little bit too. It'd be good for us, some of us old dried deadhead Baptists to start crying a little bit and let the Bible, you know the Bible said that oh David had cried so much that it dried up his tears, don't let your troubles dry your tears and make you bitter at God and bitter at life you ought to let God just break you and make you what you ought to be and all of a sudden she began to weep and cry and she began to worship you may cry yourself to sleep, but honey, while you're crying, you ought to worship a little bit. Don't let them tears be in vain. And all of a sudden, she heard this. Why? <laughs> y'all ever, y'all don't, y'all ain't, y'all a good church. I love this church. But we go to some of them churches where they got them members, they got them members. You know what I'm talking about. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Them members that they question everything that's done. And the first thing they say is, why? As if it had anything to do with them. I find, you, you may not have me back at this church, but I'm telling you, I'm not preaching to none of y'all. I'm just telling you what's out there. That's why you'll thank God what you got here. But there are some people that go to church and the whole reason they sit on pews and fold their arms and just stare at the preacher and say, bless me if you can. And then when the preacher decides we want to do something to step out by faith and do something for the cause of Christ, their first question is, Why? Why you want to do that? And the problem is, is here is Judas Iscariot, which we know what he is. And the Bible said, he said, why was not this ointment sold and given to the poor? Now I want to come out the sermon just a second. I want to step out the sermon and I want to say this. And I, want, I don't want you to get my heart wrong at all. I do not believe, how many of you believe there's something wrong with giving the poor? 
I don't believe there's anything scripturally wrong with wanting to give to the poor. What Judah said was not a problem. In fact, I believe it is more scriptural to give to the poor than what some people believe. The Bible said if a man asks you for a coat and you've got two, you are willing to be, be able to part with one of your coats and give it to him. The Bible said that the first church, I'm talking about the first church, that they sold all that they had and gave it to everybody and everybody had all things common. I believe that we're missing out on some opportunities to reach our community because we're more inward driven than we are outward driven in many churches. That's just my opinion. It ain't going to cost you nothing. And I'll be gone tonight. You ain't got to put up with me tomorrow. But I have found out the people who are more opinionated about the work of God and they're more rejecting to the work of God are the people who have never invested a dime in what God's doing. Isn't it amazing that Judas, did this ever hit you? It's amazing that Judas is opinionated about a woman pouring ointment on the Lord and it wasn't even Judas's ointment. Judas didn't put one drop in that bottle. Judas didn't pay one dime for that bottle. It didn't have nothing to do with Judas, but Judas was very opinionated about what somebody else was doing for the Lord. And I promise you, if you do something for God, the devil's going to stick his head up and he's going to try to get you to doubt that you're not doing what's right what Judas said was not the problem it was the motive behind what Judas was saying it's not what Mary was doing that bothered Judas it was who she was doing it for and the devil don't care what you do as long as you don't do it for the Lord I promise you something. If you're not doing something for Jesus, listen, a singer can sing the best songs, but if a singer is not singing for the glory of God, it will soon be self-centered. If the centering of your preaching, somebody else say amen right there, if the centering of your preaching is not God-centered, it will soon be self-centered. Giving to the poor was not a problem. It was that Judas would rather give to the poor than he would give to the Lord. That's the problem. And he's very opinionated about what somebody else... Mary poured her life into that bottle. And she had every right to give God whatever she wanted to. And that's what you need to tell the devil the next time he comes to your house too. I didn't give this to you. I didn't give this to anybody else. I'm giving this to the Lord. My life belongs to Jesus. Listen, if you let the devil, he will plan the rest of your life out to keep you so busy that God don't have any more room. So I ask you a question. Are you letting the devil keep you from giving what belongs to God? And Judas said this, Why was not this ointment sold and given to the poor? And Mary jumped up. She stood in his face and pointed her finger. And she said, I'll tell you why I didn't do it. No. Is that what she did? Well, I'm sure Mary got upset about it and got on Facebook. <laughs> I'm amazed, preacher, at how many preachers have lost their testimony. On Facebook. You know why? I'll show them. I believe that some some Baptists believe that when David said he teacheth my fingers to war, that that's what he meant. That ain't what he meant. Do you know what Mary did? The same thing she came there to do. Mary did not stop even though there was criticism. She just kept doing what she came there to do. You know what? You don't have to defend yourself either. I, I, we've had some people come against us. I didn't think I was important enough for anybody to even care what I did. And, and if they really knew how insignificant I can be to this whole thing, 
they would just move on and deal with somebody that's way more important than me. But we've had people send us nasty messages and tell us we ought not to be doing some things that we're doing. and They're just very opinionated. But see, the problem is, is they... I had a pastor who was a hero of mine who rebuked me up and down on Facebook. And I it bothered me. I'll be honest with you. I let some of that stuff bother me too much. And you can ask my wife, it sent me into a depression. I started getting upset. And I started p- apologizing. And I said, God, I'm sorry. I, I'm not doing anything other than what I just know to do. And that's just give you everything I've got. And try to go as full for God as I can. We tried to raise money this year to buy us a, a, a motor home to travel in as evangelists. I told you this morning, 295 days in a hotel room will drive you crazy. And I want them youngins to have a good place that they can call home. I want my wife to have her own bed, have her own pillow to sleep on. And I want my children to be able to do homeschool in a place where down the hall they ain't cussing and drinking and partying. That's all I wanted. I wasn't doing it to be glorify, glorifying me or glorifying who I was. And that preacher called me and it bothered me so bad that I said, God, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do it. And right in the middle of that little pity party walking around for a few days with my lip dragging the ground and tears rolling out of my eyes, the Holy Spirit of God came here and said, Do you remember when I called you? I called you from a little town called Cowpens, South Carolina, and that man there didn't even know your name back then, and I was the one that called you. It wasn't him that called you. It was me that called you. You're not doing that for them. You're not doing that for him. you doing this for me and if all of hell comes against you and everybody turns their back on you if God be for you who can be against you I I rose up from that little pity party you know what the Bible says the Bible said that Jesus rose up and said let her alone Mary didn't have to say I I ain't got enough time. I've only been preaching 29 minutes. I've been watching it. I'm going to try to get you all to get some ice cream. Amen. I want some too. But I'm having a good time preaching. Mary is probably one of the most active people in this chapter. Would you all agree with that? Say amen. And to be so active in this chapter, this astounded me. To be so active, she doesn't speak one word the whole chapter. You know why? Because it ain't about what you say. It is about what you do. And here she is, and she ain't saying a word. But she sure is loving on Jesus an awful lot. And you ain't got to say a word either. You know, when we go on Facebook, and I know I joke about that stuff, but it it is getting bad. (laughs) Facebook says, what's on your mind? The Bible says, a fool uttereth all his mind. Don't tell everything on Facebook. Can all the youngins say amen? Don't put all your business on social media. And here Mary is, and she's not saying a word to Judas. But Jesus is. I believe that when we defend ourselves, and we preach our own cause, that we take one of the greatest attributes of God, and that is, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You know what I found out, preacher? If I just get busy doing what I came here to do, God can keep the wolves off of me and I won't have to worry about it. And I don't think that everybody that's opinionated about what you do is your enemy. I think some of them may be misled, but it don't matter if they're meaning it out of the best of their heart. If you're doing what you know God's called you to do, you keep doing that. And you don't worry about nobody else. If God's blessing it, let God defend it. 
You just get busy doing it. Somebody say amen. I'm done. She resisted the critic. She released the content. And watch this, the last one, I'm going to give it to you. The last response that Mary had, she rejoiced in the cause. She rejoiced in the cause. What cause is that, preacher? You know what? Dr. Cox, I do not believe that Mary came there with the intent that what she was doing, Jesus was going to use it as a ministry. I already told you that what she did for Jesus, He carried it with Him. He said, against the day of my burying has she kept this. And I started thinking about that. Against the day of my burying. That phrase stuck out of me, stuck out in my mind, and it would not let me go. You ever get those scriptures that you try to take hold of what it means and then it grabs you and takes hold of you? And I, I had that one would not leave me alone. I'd sit up in the bed against the day of my bearing. What did he mean by that? What did he mean by against the day of my bearing? And this may not be some theological mind bomb on you, but it sure did help me out a whole lot. And he said against the day of my bearing, she's done this. I don't believe that Mary came there to do something that would turn into a miracle. I just believe in the moment. Can somebody say amen right here? In the moment Mary said, I want to give God all that I've got. I want to worship Him. I want to give my life back to Him. And Mary did not think that Jesus was going to carry what she did outside of the walls. But she just did it in the moment because she wanted to love on the Lord and that's what's amazing about God God can take just a moment and a decision that you make to do something so small and turn it into a miracle and a message and a ministry for the cause of Christ God can take your little moments and make them ministries you just got to be willing to live in that moment and he said, against the day of my bearing. And, and I ain't got enough time to preach all that I want to preach out of that. But I started looking at everywhere Jesus went after, after this day. And the Bible starts out by saying, y'all with me, say amen. The Bible starts out by saying, six days before the Passover. In the Old Testament, any time you hear the word Passover... It is because there is a lamb that is going to be slain for the sins of a nation. But we ain't in the Old Testament. We in the New Testament. And in the New Testament, when you hear the word Passover, it is not just a lamb, it is the lamb that is going to be slain for the sins of not just a nation, but the entire world. Aren't you glad He came and died for somebody like you? So six days before Jesus would die on an old rugged cross, one week before Jesus would die on an old rugged cross, this woman poured out onto Him and she did not know that it was going to be a ministry that Jesus would carry with Him everywhere He went. That stuff was so potent that it would anoint. They would take just four drops and anoint the dead bodies and it should last 40 days in those days but she poured the whole bottle on him and I got to reading about people Jesus met on the way to Calvary and I got to thinking about what Pilate thought as he stood there and he said don't you know I've got power to take your life or give you life and Jesus rose up the God in him rose up and said you've got no power other than the power that I give you and old Pilate took a deep breath in and smelled that anointment on him and said that's 
the anointed one. There's something about him. Oh, there's something about that righteous man. I think about old Caiaphas as Caiaphas ran back and slapped him. But when Caiaphas drew back, he knew the law. He knew the principles of those Jews. And when he draw back that hand, he could smell that ointment and it had that anointing on Jesus. And Pilate or Caiaphas knew there's something special about that man Jesus. I just believe that there was a thief one day right beside him on the old rugged cross. And for a moment he was mocking and he was ridiculing. But then a wind blew over that mountain and he took a deep breath and he said there's something special about that one right there. Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. And I believe that that anointing, Jesus carried it all the way to the grave. Oh, there's so much more I want to say about that. But then I got to wrap and messed up y'all's mic. When they buried Jesus and put him in that borrowed tomb. Aren't you glad he left it just like he found it? <laughs> Empty. <laughs> oh, glory to God. I love him. He laid in that borrowed tomb and got up in three days. The Bible said that at the dawning of the week, the dawning of that first day, that first day was the day of resurrection. There's a group of women that come and the night before they had went out and the Bible said they bought spices. Y'all remember that? They bought spices for what purpose? To anoint the body of Jesus. And as they're walking that morning to that grave, one of them turns to the other and says, Hey, what about that big stone that they rolled in the front of that cave in the front of the door? Who's going to roll the stone away for us? What they didn't know is God had already taken care of it. Hey, how many of you, you're worried about something that's coming and you hadn't even got there to see that God's already taken care of it before you get there? And when they got there, the Bible said that they found the stone was rolled away and they looked inside, but He was not there for He had risen and gone away. And I got to reading over there that Mary had anointed Him in that upper room against the day of His burying. But when they got there, they had went out and tried to buy spices. Does that hit you at all? Those women went out and bought spices for a body that they never got to anoint because when they got there, He was already up and alive and they had spent money on something they never got to use <laughs> and I got to looking in that crowd and I got to looking for one person and I found out she wasn't in there now there's a couple Marys in there but that one ain't in there and I got to thinking of all people that enjoyed anointing Jesus why ain't Mary in that crowd that day to go anoint the body of Jesus you know why she had already done it <laughs> hey you know what God told me to come here and tell you that if you're going to live for him and you're going to give God your life and you're going to surrender to his call and you're going to do what God's called you to do and you want your family to stand up and say as for me and my house we're going to serve the Lord if you're going to give God your life you better do it now because there's coming a day when they'll seek him and they will not find him and there is coming a day when you'll want to live right for God and it'll be too late. So if you're going to anoint Him, you better do it now. Katie, y'all come back up here and sing that did I mention. And here's, here's the invitation. Here's the invitation. Have you surrendered all you have to God? Have you released it on Him? I want every Christian that can and will in here tonight to make a decision that we're closing out this year and I'm going to close it out right. But I'm starting 2018 with a desire and a heart full to give God everything 